and in each of these directions, you're creating a, a notion of what the neighborhood looks like. And these are apparently extremely use, useful in, in computer vision. And it gives you a 120 dimensional, uh, 120 dimensional vector. And then to align two images, you try to find images with, with similar ones of these features. So you have these huge set of features, uh, these SIP features, and you want to then find all the nearest neighbors of these SIP features. And this is a problem which occurs a lot in a lot of computer vision applications. So you actually want to solve this nearest neighbor problem when your dimension is 128 dimensional space. So hopefully I didn't butcher the SIP features too much, but um, hopefully that gives you kind of an idea of how you get a, a high dimensional vector. Um, and they usually use the uh, Euclidean distance as the distance between these, as, as far as I've seen. Um, so th there are other techniques for, for doing this, and I um, and some other variations, but it's, it gives you some similar structure. There are other areas where you get high dimensional vectors. If you have, um, think of, you have a bunch of customers in the company, and you have a bunch of attributes of the customers. Each of the attributes is going to be, um, is, um, is, is going to be one dimension. And so there you may have, you may have 100 attributes based on which websites they, that you're monitoring that they tend to go to. That, that may be, you know, 100 different websites that's 100 dimensional space. Yeah. Another example is the famously Walmart had the analysis where they found people buy beer diverse together. Yeah. But they were analyzing that as each receipt was a vector where you had a value for every product they sold. So they were, you know, their dimension analysis was in the tens of thousands. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a good application. So we'll actually, I, I, I have a lecture later on on um, frequent item sets where we'll talk about the algorithms where they do that. And they don't quite use the high dimensional structure. Um, in, in that case, it's, it's uh, it, it, because each list has so, such a small number of coordinates, you want to analyze it in a different way. We'll, 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 we'll look at that later, but that's another good, um, like a good place for these sorts of data to come up with. Where you get these sorts of high dimensional vectors. Um, okay, so so we have this this hashing technique, which doesn't quite work, or I've told you doesn't quite work well for this application. It's more returning the ones within a threshold. The, we have a low dimensional technique. What are techniques we would use for maybe? Let's start out with what I call medium dimension. So th this would be about where um, V equals something like um, like between 5 and maybe 20. Or maybe some people say 5 and 12. So, so, so think of it five dimension. What, what? Uh, I'm sure someone's heard of a data structure for certain for nearest neighbors. This. Is anyone? Uh, like a quatri or a KD tree. Okay, good. So, um, so, 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 so let me. So again, unfortunately, I can't draw in high dimensions. Um, so I'll, I'll I'll make the example in two D, but the but the techniques will generalize, and I'll explain, you know, about why you can get up to these these dimensions. So the idea again is that you have, okay, so so you're gonna and I mentioned this in a previous lecture earlier. You're gonna have some um, some data points, and so you're gonna build something like a binary tree on these data points, but you're going to, but I can't sort in in, in every dimension. But the, the key of the binary tree was that you found the middle point and you split on each half. And then you, of that half, you found the middle point and you split. Right, so, so the most popular one is a KD tree. Um, 
And so what the KD tree does is it, is it, it starts with just one dimension. Um, and so let's say that in the x direction, in this way, um, this is the point in the middle. So I'm going to split these points. So I'm going to I'm going to draw split the points this way, and at the same so let's call this point one, and I'm going to have a tree that splits that point one. And then in the next round, I'm going to split in the in the other direction. So I'm going to find the point in the middle on the right, and it's going to be this point. Let's call this two, and then on the left, it's going to be this point here. So this is called this point three, and I split on the left here, or on the, on the right here on two, and the left on three. And then I'm going to switch back to the x direction again. If I was in higher dimension, I would switch to the z direction, or whatever the third dimension is. But once you finish all the dimensions, you switch back to where you started from. And so then, let's see, so then in these, I will, this point is the median, and this one, because it's an even number of points, I can pick either one of them, it doesn't matter. And you do this until each thing only has one point, or some small number of points. So if this was four, five, six, seven, then I have four, five, six, seven. So I split here, and so I know that this is, I split on x, then y, then x, and Y, and I keep going down until everything is split into some cell. So this is to find the nearest neighbor. Okay. So this yeah. is like the pre-processing. This is the pre-processing okay. step. Okay. But good question. How do I find the nearest neighbor? Let's say my query <coughs> point is here. Right. So. The first thing I do is I'm going to go down this tree and find which cell it lies in. I'm going to go down here, and then I'm going to go in the left side of cell. And I found the cell here. And then I find the closest point to Q in the cell. Let's say it's 7, which is on the left. So I've got this distance. And now, if once I know this closest point here, I can draw a circle around this point Q of the radius to the closest point. And if this radius is completely contained in the cell, um, then I'm done. I know it can't be anything else. But it's not completely in the cell. A little bit fell outside the cell here. So that means I need to go, I need to go back up. This is where Q is. I need to go back up and check here as well. I need to check. Cell six, um, what? Not, not here, sorry. Uh, I need to check, this was, there was a split here and I went left. I need to go up and check this cell as well. And see, then find the closest point to Q in this cell. If, if it was right here, I would have found a closer point. But there's nothing in here, so seven was the closest point. And I know that there's no other cell that contains any point closer than at seven, and I can stop. So, um, so this case is an easy case. Let me show a little bit harder case here. Let's say my query is here, right? So then I still went down here, and I found the closest point in the cell was seven. Now I draw this radius. Uh. Questions. How did you choose seven when you put Q to the point? Okay, so how did I do this? So I first looked at this bisector. This is the top one here. Okay. It's on the right side, so I go down to this subtree. Okay. I look at two, I split on the Y coordinate, I go to the lower side. Okay. Then I go to seven, I split on the X coordinate, and I went to the left side, and I'm here. Okay. And now in this this cell, uh, maybe seven's the only point there. I can choose to store one on either the left or the right side, or so there's some, you can store stuff on the boundary in different ways. Um, so that's up to your implementation details. Um, so, so that's why I found this cell, and then you kind of walk up the tree. So, so now I have this case where 
I also have to check this cell, but this one is still okay. But I don't have to check this one. So, but now I go up one level. I said, do I have to check cell six? Right? Or the cell associated with, with six here. And I don't, this, this doesn't intersect. So I so that means I don't have to look at this whole subtree here. I go up to um, split on one and I say, do I am I is there, how far am I from the split on one in the x coordinate from my query point y? And this is this distance is shorter than the distance to my closest point. So that means I need to go down this subtree as well. And I look at the split on three, and I say I can get to either here. So I need to look down both of these two subtrees. And so I start by, let's say I start by going to the one towards five. And I think that, uh, so I look here at the split on five. I have to go to both of these subtrees still. And let's say I first went to the one where I had point three in it, and three was down here. I found three, and I got a new nearest neighbor. So now I do this. Now I say, OK, this is a, this is a new nearest neighbor. Um, um, do I need to look? Now I check, do I need to look in this cell? No, I don't need to look in, in this cell here. I go up to up to split point four. Do I need to look on the right or the left? I'll look on, I still have to check this, this point here when I split on three. I come down here and I check in this cell and I find a closer point here and I get a slightly smaller circle. And now I don't need to check in this cell either. So I still had to look at most of this tree here in this example. And this can happen. It's, there are some guarantees you can make about KD tree, and at least in two dimensions. But they're not, you know, the theoretical guarantees are not all that strong. But in practice, it works pretty well. Usually, you can find a close point, and then you don't have to check too much of the tree. You can do this thing where you're pruning the search strategy. Okay, so do you need to do another example, or was this? Was, was this clear? Was that a, another example or? Yeah? Okay, okay, good. Let me uh, do another query point here. And okay, and I'll try and do it in different color. Here. Okay, so let's say, let me find an interesting query point. Okay, so this, this is Q. Okay, so let's so let's go through this step by step. So the first split point is one, and Q is on the left side here. I go down this side here. Then I look at the split on two in the y direction. It's on the top side, so I go up towards six. Six is on the left side of six. I go down on the left side of six. Okay, I found the region. Now I need to find the closest point in this in this. Uh, in the cell six, let's say I have these these uh, two points. Only let's say two is stored down here, so it's between this point six and this other point. And I'll just check all these points, right? Um, and I this is the closest point, and so I can draw or I can draw a radius that looks like this. Okay. So now. I need, to, I need to rule out any other points for being closer. So um, first thing is to do is to check this neighboring cell over here. Um, I guess if I had drawn this right, there should have been a little bit of overlap here. Unless it's exactly parallel, there's going to be a little bit of overlap. So I need to check in this cell as well. But this cell didn't have any points in it, so I don't really need to check. So, okay, so, so I checked over here. So now I'm going to go up the tree and check again. So I go up to the split on, that was the split on six, I'm going to go up the split on two. And I'm going to say, could I, could I possibly have a point below the split that's closer than point six? 
And the answer is yes, there could possibly be one. So I need to go back down. And I say, let's look on the left side or the right side, look on the, on the right side here, and find the closest point in this region, which includes the point two. Um, let's say two is not any closer, right? So, I've, so I still have the same, the same point here. And, and this point is not closer either. So I'm done with this search tree. I still need to check the other side of split on seven. So I go and I check over here as well. And, uh, and I need to check if there's a point in this small region, and, and there's not. So then I clear out this whole, this region. So I can go back up the tree. I finish the split on two. I go up to the split on one, up to the root. Can I possibly have any point on the left side of the split on point one, which is closer than Q? And I can just look at this vertical distance, and the answer is, is no, I can't. So I don't have to check this whole half of the tree. So this is the big savings here. So in order to find the cell, takes the height of the tree, and the height of the tree is, is log n. And usually you don't need to check too many other cells. Usually that's the case. So usually the runtime looks close to like log n. Um, but it's hard to prove things about it because of that one example where I, I showed where you had to check almost the entire tree. Okay. Um, so this is the KD tree. There are other versions of this instead. Instead of splitting x, splitting x and y, so let's see, the KD tree, um, you, you alternate, <coughs> split on each um, dimension. You're splitting just one dimension at a time. There's, there's a different way of doing it called a quad tree. So, so people remember quad tree before? So, so what's the difference with a quad tree? If you go to have like the zero turn, the four turn, and the node is going to get split, it has four turn, four split. Yeah, so in, in general, you're going to have two to the D children or zero children. Um, right, so, so what you're going to do is you're going to, usually what you do is you assume you scale the points so they lie in a square. And instead of splitting on points, what you do is you, um, right here. You, you, you pick the point in the middle of the square and you split it into two to the d cells. In, 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 uh, in two dimensions it's four cells, in three dimensions it's eight cells. Right? So you pick a middle point and you put it into these smaller squares. And then if there are points in each of the squares, then you do this split again. So then if there are, and you keep going, now this one has a, has a point, so you, if, if you have one point, you can stop. Or if you have like 10 points, you can probably stop, right? Um, small number of points, you stop, but these cells are empty, so I can stop as well. Um, this cell is empty, this one needs a split, there's a point right here, this one needs a split. Um, actually, each of them only has, has one point, so. These each have one point. These are empty, but these have four points. I split again, and I still have four points. And then finally, I split down to the bottom. So you, the a difference is that you split um, geometrically. So it, the, with, with the KD tree, you know that the tree is balanced. 
you always have half the points on either side of the tree, so you know the height has to be log n. So if you've taken an algorithms class, you should be able to quickly see the height of this is also log n. Um, the quad tree, you might not have a depth on the height of the tree. Um, you could have all the points in here and keep splitting. Um, but at this level, I did something kind of silly. Um, I split and then I split again. And if I look at the tree here, this node is only going to have one child, and this node only essentially have one child. So what I can do is I can compress this tree, and I can say I'm going to ignore these uh, these these cells. And so from from this node at split at this point, the tree essentially thinks of going down to this split point next. Here I went to this split point, this split point, this split point I'm done, but here I jump down to the smaller split point at this level. And if you do something like this, this is called a um, compressed uh, um, quad tree, where you kind of skip these extra things here. If you do these compressed quad trees, um, there's a way of rebalancing them so the height is log n. So you can get the same kind of expected search properties here. And, or if you can stop when the resolution is small enough. If the cells get small enough that you don't care about the distance anymore, you can also stop. And that will also guarantee the height is, is log n um, if you care about the resolution at a small enough level. And so you can prove a lot of things about these quad trees, and they're very kind of these compressed quad trees. So all of the theoretical bounds are based on these, but in practice, people use more, something more like the key. Um, but, but these have some some new results. The, the the final thing I'll mention, which is used a lot in practice, is called an R tree, which is you you um, the key difference is the split. You, um, is, is, is to divide into um, into some rectangles. So let, let me draw these, these these points here again. So what I want to do is I'm going to I'm going to start with the rectangle which contains all of the points. So I'm going to find the smallest rectangle which contains all the points. And um, it's because rectangles are easier to easier to process inside the computer. You could think of like an ellipse or a ball if you wanted to, but rectangles are easier to work with. And then the next thing I do is I find Two rectangles which might be overlapping, which also contain all of the points. Maybe this one and and this one. Um, maybe in this case, you would need to make. You could always also make this smaller, but the problem is that it's hard to find the best choice of rectangle. So this is a hard problem to figure out what this is. <coughs> the KD tree and the quad tree, it's pretty easy to figure out how to split them. The R tree is this can be more challenging. Um, and so then you can keep dividing, then the next level you divide this maybe into this rectangle and say this rectangle here. And so what happens is the rectangles adjust to the data a lot better. So in the quad tree, you're doing it based on geometry, and you can do some tricks with the compressed quad tree, but the data <coughs> adjust to the data. Um, and it, um, but what the R tree does is kind of automatically. You find the tightest rectangles which contain the points. And so this is used a lot in kind of lower, medium dimension, like three or four dimensions, and is used a lot, in, I think in CAD, this is like the main uh, searching structure they use. So CAD is this tool for designing things, and, and they build these bounding boxes around structures, and then look deeply under these bounding boxes. And so 
CAD implements this as an R tree and can handle really large data sets. Um, so th th there, are, there are lots of other variations of these, but these are kind of the, the important ones. Um, okay, so, but the, the problem that happened is all of these are based on, um, you're trying to search for distances, but you're using these rectangles or square structures, right? So remember, given, given a query point, let's say, remember I had this query point here, I looked at this circle around this query point of a certain radius. And I need to compare this against these, these rectangle or these squares. So why does this stop working in, in higher dimensions? So I mean, I can still run the algorithms fine, but what happens is you end up, they end up needing to do this, what happens is like that first example I did where you had to search almost all the points in the tree. You're not, the pruning is not working. And so there's, so th there's this, th there, there, there are lots of ways to see this, but if you look at a, um, a unit um, cube versus, um, versus ball in, in R D. okay? So I'm, I'm gonna look at a, I'm gonna find a cube so that the, the length of the side, so you have a center, and the radius is one. And then I'm also going to find a sphere, so it has a center, and the radius is one. Okay, so now what's the volume of the cube in uh, uh, the volume of the cube in uh, the volume of the cube in when I'm in RD, in D dimensions. So in, in, in 2D, the volume is, the area is four, right? It's two by two. In, in RD, the volume is, is two to the power D. So this is growing exponentially with D. Okay, so now, what is the volume of the ball in um, the volume of the ball of the So I have to look this up. Um, so it's going to be pi to the d over two over the over the gamma function uh, of d over 2 plus 1. So this gamma function is this weird function which is not everywhere defined, um, but uh, it's defined on, on integers which are even, on even integers, and on even integers it looks like um, on, on an even integer uh, t, it looks like t minus 1 factorial. So this is about equal to pi to the d over 2 over d over 2 factorial. Okay? So as d gets larger, what happens to this number? So who, who's good with factorials? The radius is one, so it's the so it, in in the in the plane it's it's uh, <coughs> pi r squared, right? And r is one. Um, in in higher dimensions, you get an x uh, exponent of pi. So what happens to this is something crazy. This goes to zero in the you know in, in the limit as d goes to infinity. This value goes to zero. This, x, this factorial term grows a lot faster than this pi to the d over 2 term. It's kind of, that's, that's really weird, right? 
<laughs> I put this, the biggest ball which fits inside this, this square, and, and, I, and I look what happened as, it, as, as d goes to infinity. The volume of the square <coughs> grows really quickly, goes 2 to the d, it's growing exponentially. The volume of the ball, the biggest ball that fits inside of it, is going to zero. So as this grows exponentially, this goes to zero. What happens is you get these, these corners of the square. These take up more and more space as you get to higher and higher dimensions. So this, but what we're doing here is we're approximating these these balls that we want to search all the points that fall in here, approximate them by rectangles. There are different ways we're approximating them by rectangles, um, or essentially squares. Rectangles may be worse because they're skewed, right? But even if they're squares like in the quadrate, you know, the, we're comparing something that has, you know, volume which is vastly different. At this scale, this one goes to zero, and this one goes, grows exponentially with dimension. So, we're not able to do this, this comparison. Um, so th th that's why these stop working in higher dimensions. There's, th there are lots of other weird phenomena that happen. When you get to something like 12 dimensions, um, and, you, and you put random points inside of, inside of any object, say random points inside of a, a cube, um, or random points inside of a ball, if you look at the, the distance to the, from one point to the nearest neighbor and then to the furthest neighbor, those are going to be very close to each other. They're, all the points are going to be about, all the distances are going to be about the same if they're random in these high dimensional objects. And it's, there's this kind of these really strange phenomena which happen. And so these kind of stop working at some point. Okay, but I said I, you could probably get up to 20. In fact, um, so th there are people who use these up to, up to, to 20 dimensions. Um, they do a couple things to get past this cursive dimension out. Okay, so there are a couple tricks you can do. Um, the first trick is, is called an approximate nearest neighbor. So let me... So I've got this nearest neighbor phi. So the nearest neighbor of a, of a you know, um, of, of Q is was equal to this phi of P over a point Q. Um, so an epsilon, um, epsilon approximate nearest neighbor of Q is, is going to be um, some in, in the point set P um, such that um, the distance between P and Q is less than 1 plus epsilon times the distance between Q and the, the exact nearest neighbor. Okay? So, this is the distance that I want to find. This is the exact one. And I'm going to inflate it by a little bit. So epsilon is going to be, usually epsilon is going to be some small number between 0 and 1. Maybe it's off by, off by 10%. So if this is 0.1, then this is say I'm off, it can be 10% larger than, than the exact nearest neighbor. Then, then this is an epsilon approximate nearest neighbor. So because we don't care exactly about the distance, we should be okay with something that has is almost the closest point. So then what I can do here, instead of searching inside of this ball, I can shrink it by this epsilon factor and look at a smaller ball. And what tends to happen with these smaller balls is that 
you, you can do a lot more pruning of the tree. It's a lot less likely to go over this boundary here. So I, before I was over this boundary on this side, the smaller ball is no longer over the boundary. <coughs> and a, a small amount of air, either 10% or even 1%, will really kind of allow you to prune much more of the tree and allow your searches to work, work a lot better. Um, and so these approximate nearest neighbors work really well. There's a, a library you can use called the ANN library for approximate nearest neighbor. If you search for just ANN in Google, you'll, you'll find them on the top links. Um, and this builds a data structure basically on a, based on a kitty tree, and it does this approximate, um, this finds the approximate nearest neighbor and works really quickly. And um, I know um, the, the guy who's implemented this and maintains it is uh, David Mount, and I, I've asked him about um, you know, how high dimension people use this. He's like, you know, some people it stops working after 10 or 12, some people get up to it in 20 or even, even higher dimensions. Um, so, so this is without changing anything about this data structure. You're still using rectangles, but by doing this approximation, you can do a lot better. But then why was there this difference between 20 and 12? Right? So, so one thing you can do is this approximate version. The other thing is that your data you know, is usually in a lower um, dimensional um, um, subspace. So this is really hard to draw a picture of, but you can think of you've got two dimensions and your data um, would if your data is all in here, but if it looks like it lies on this line here, it's in a one-dimensional subspace of this two-dimensional space. So your data often looks like it lies in a lower dimension. So this, this may seem kind of strange. It usually doesn't exactly lie in here, but it's pretty close to here. There's some usually rounding noise in every coordinate. But so, 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 so you know, one 